Good afternoon. Welcome to U.S. Japan Research Institute Seminar on the topics of new directions of U.S. Japan higher education cooperation in the globalizing world in the aftermath of the Great East Japan earthquake. Uh, USJI was established jointly by five leading Japanese universities, namely Kyoto, Keio, Ritsumeikan, Tokyo, and Waseda universities, in order to provide policy oriented academic research results to a wider audience here in, the, in Washington, D.C. Since the inaugural seminars in March 2009 in Tokyo, every September and February, we have USJI Week here in Washington, D.C. This week, under the title of Reconstruction after the Great East Japan Earthquake, we have five seminars, two collaborative lectures, open house, and social networking reception. Japan produces many efficient, competitive manufacturing goods, so our productivity of Prime Minister is also very high. Produced six Prime Ministers uh, during the last five years. And September uh, 2009, as the first uh, USJ week, uh, Prime Minister was Mr. Hatoyama. And uh, also last year, the Prime Minister was uh, Mr. Khan. This time, Prime Minister is uh, Mr. Noda. Among three, two of them are our graduates, uh, one from DMS uh, Tokyo, one from Waseda University. Uh, today, the title of the seminar is A New Directions of U.S. Japan Higher Education Cooperation in the Global uh, World. And we are very pleased that outstanding faculty members of our two universities, uh, uh, namely Tokyo and Waseda, as well as uh, distinguished scholars from the United States, join to the seminars. And uh, I would like to uh, introduce Professor Kuroda as a moderator of the seminars. He is a graduate of Waseda, uh, Stanford, and Cornell Universities. And he works uh, for the uh, well, Business Society, then he became the uh, Associate Professor at Hiroshima University. Then uh, he is now the uh, professor at the uh, Graduate School of Asia Pacific Studies at Waseda University, and also Dean of the Center for International Education at Waseda. Professor Thank you very much. Uh, welcome again uh, to this. Welcome again uh, to this uh, seminar on uh, higher education cooperation between the two countries, uh, uh, United States and Japan. Uh, I'm Kazuo Kuroda from Waseda University. Uh, let me first uh, introduce our, uh, uh, myself and also actually our uh, commentators, discussants, uh, Professor Sayashi Daishi from the University of Tokyo, uh, Professor Nuduri Asirumumba from Cornell University, uh, Professor uh, James Williams uh, from George uh, Washington University. They are all actually uh, my uh, old, uh, not only friends actually, but because uh, Professor Shimumba uh, is my uh, professor at Cornell University, so I feel actually very uh, uh, stressed, of course, I mean, because in front of my own professor, of course, here. And then, uh, and they are uh, very much experienced, of course, uh, in the field of higher education uh, in the United States and, uh, and Japan. Actually, the two American professors also has uh, uh, some uh, time of the years, I mean, to spend in, in Japan to collaborate uh, uh, with, uh, to work with uh, Japanese professors in their uh, research and education. So uh, we are very much delighted to have these uh, professors to, in this uh, seminar, I mean, to uh, collaborate in the actually to make uh, suggestions for the future higher education collaborations between the two countries. Uh, the, the, uh, uh, let me also actually explain uh, briefly uh, the background of, uh, of our uh, 
uh, this seminar. Uh, in the very early uh, this year, uh, even before the, the earthquake, uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and uh, USGA had their consultations, and then they discussed the possibility to have uh, this kind of seminar uh, on higher education to propose uh, there are uh, some kind of uh, policy recommendations for uh, higher education collaborations between the two countries uh, to co commemorate uh, the, the possible uh, Japanese Prime Minister's visit uh, to the United States, which was originally scheduled uh, in the uh, beginning of the September, uh, and which is now actually, but the, uh, because of this high productivity of the Prime Ministers. Uh, in Japan, uh, we again changed the Prime Minister uh, very recently, and then uh, the uh, Prime Minister's visit uh, is uh, cancelled or no, postponed. Uh, so uh, uh, we, uh, but but anyway, actually, the, our, our current Prime Minister, uh, I'm not sure how many uh, days he will last, but uh, he he's a graduate of the University, and we are still hoping actually to. Uh, to submit this uh, policy recommendations of higher education collaborations between the two countries uh, to the government, the both governments uh, after uh, this seminar. So, so that was the original uh, idea uh, of this uh, seminar. And then uh, yesterday uh, I attended uh, an interesting symposium sponsored by the Sasaka Peace Foundation and others, and then uh, there uh, uh, there is a, a keynote speech actually made by the Mr. Maihara, the Honorable uh, Maihara, uh, who uh, just lost actually uh, to be a, a Prime Minister, but uh, uh, still actually got the influential positions at the uh, uh, Democratic Party. I mean, he, he talked mostly actually about the security issues uh, between the Japan, I mean, uh, uh, the, the possible collaboration, the security uh, issues. Uh, uh, between the Japan and then, uh, the United States, but uh, also he mentioned uh, uh, about uh, the, the one of the three uh, important dimensions uh, is uh, educational cultural exchange uh, between the two countries. And he also personally mentioned to me, I mean, uh, when I had a uh, brief uh, talk with him, I mean, uh, uh, that was identified uh, by the Democratic Party of Japan. I mean, to enhance actually that. Uh, enhancing the Japanese uh, and U.S. Uh, collaborations in higher education or uh, the cultural exchange is the, one of the uh, priority issues. Uh, so I was uh, pretty encouraged actually about that. Uh, so the first, uh, 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 so yes, uh, the first uh, dimensions I'd like to uh, uh, propose, I mean, uh, to, to uh, as a, a policy recommendations for higher education, uh, uh, is the U.S.-Japan higher education collaborations uh, for the global issues. Uh, yes, uh, indeed, we had a, a terrible earthquake in March uh, 11th, and then, but uh, just uh, immediately after the earthquake, the President Obama uh, said the United States stands ready to help the Japanese people in the time of the Great Trial. Uh, uh, the friendship and alliance between our uh, two nations is unshakable, and then only a strength over uh, our uh, resolve to stand with the uh, people of Japan as they overcome this tragedy. And then, uh, not only the wars, actually, he uh, and the United States uh, send the hundreds of missions to support uh, uh, the emergency uh, situation in Japan and, and, and recovery efforts, and then uh, also deployed uh, uh, leading experts to the uh, damaged nuclear reactors. And then we are very, very grateful actually for uh, what uh, US has done actually for the, uh, Japan. It's still actually doing, I mean, for, for Japan. Uh, but not only uh, for the United States, but also other uh, countries. Of course, the United States provided the uh, largest and the greatest uh, support for Japan in this period, but uh, uh, other countries, including the very poor countries or farthest countries actually in the world, uh, uh, provided also some donations and then uh, supports uh, missions actually to Japan to help uh, to help I mean in this emergency period. So uh, this experience uh, reminded us uh, fully the importance of the building and main, uh, uh, maintaining a global partnership and the need to further establish organizations and policies to re, uh, promote and strengthen uh, bilateral relations and international cooperation uh, for the global issues also. Uh, surprisingly, actually, after the earthquake, 
uh, people, of course, I mean, uh, started to uh, be a, a little inward looking, of course. But uh, now, uh, because we experienced this uh, so much uh, support from the international community for uh, Japan's reconstructions, uh, many people actually now uh, started to re-evaluate, uh, I mean, we appreciate the, the importance of the international corporations. Uh, so, uh, and then uh, looking back uh, our experience uh, between the United States and Japan, uh, in 1990s, we had a more agenda, uh, and then uh, which was the bilateral uh, policy to promote uh, the, these two countries' uh, collaborations for the global issues, and then that experience proved that uh, partnerships exponentially uh, increased positive outcomes and can achieve uh, more progress, actually, in our uh, shared target uh, of the uh, global issues. And then, of course, higher education uh, is an influential uh, player, and then uh, we can collaborate to generate new knowledge to solve problems, and also we can uh, develop human capacities through education uh, to solve problems in the global uh, arena. Uh, Professor Ashram and Professor James Williams has uh, really actually and have uh, many experiences with uh, collaborating with the Japanese researchers uh, uh, to uh, work on uh, these issues, especially in the education development, and myself also actually. But uh, that uh, can be uh, a good uh, base, I mean, for the future collaborations of the higher education in, uh, between the two countries, I think. So, so the first uh, recommendation I'd like to make is to secure funding to promote linkages between the uh, scholars and research uh, organizations to sustain and increase joint research and education efforts in the global issues and, uh, and uh, establishing uh, national bilateral relations such as common agenda in 99, like 1990, uh, 1990s uh, that we had in, 19, in 1990s, uh, 1990s and then uh, fund relevant organizations like uh, Japan Foundation as, uh, Center for Global Partnerships that the center was created to promote the uh, the bilateral relationship, I mean, uh, collaboration between the United States and Japan. But uh, very interestingly, the, uh, this uh, center uh, set uh, in the Japan Foundations uh, had the original, actually, uh, perspectives to contribute to the global uh, issues uh, through the uh, bilateral collaboration between the United States and Japan. So that kind of uh, the funding, I think, is uh, very important. Uh, for the future collaborations. And also, not only the government, but also the institutional uh, uh, <coughs> commitment has to be made by the universities. Uh, for example, the University of Tokyo has, uh, uh, in their uh, discussion of the internationalization policies, they identified a service, to, for, service for the global public as the uh, their uh, missions and also Waseda University is now discussing very uh, actively actually for our uh, missions of the internationalization and then uh, the contributions uh, to the global uh, society is going to be a key word I mean, for our uh, institutions and then uh, so these uh, sorts of activities uh, would probably facilitate, facilitate the higher education collaborations in the global issues between the two countries. The second uh, part of my uh, recommendation is about the uh, uh, Asian uh, regional framework of higher education. Uh, uh, many uh, empirical uh, studies has identi have uh, uh, identified uh, that there, uh, there is a regionalization uh, uh, of uh, higher education, not only in Europe, but also in Asia or some other parts of the uh, world, Latin America and Africa. And then, uh, for example, uh, if we look at the student mobility in the regions in Asia, the growing number of students started to move from uh, move uh, Asia to uh, from Asia to Asia. And then, uh, if we look at the uh, uh, collaborative degree programs or uh, international university link uh, 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 partnership agreements, all actually indicates that the intra-regional. Uh, 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 collaborations is now very much actually uh, enhanced. Uh, so that's why uh, the recent uh, uh, policy uh, of, uh, uh, of the, uh, the each government in Asia, for example, in Southeast Asia, uh, in the process of the formulating the ASEAN community, the Southeast Asian ministers of education organizations uh, is now try trying to promote the idea uh, or concept of uh, higher education common space in South Asia, uh, and then uh, which is a very similar uh, concept of the uh, European higher education arena uh, area uh, in Europe. Uh, 
and then uh, also ASEAN, uh, 10 countries of uh, Southeast Asian countries, and uh, plus three, uh, the China, South Korea, and Japan, uh, started to have a higher education policy dialogue uh, in 2009, and then uh, in uh, align with this idea of the, uh, formulating East Asian community. And also, very interestingly, in the Northeast Asia, the three countries uh, started to have a trilateral summit uh, among the, uh, China, uh, South Korea, and Japan four years ago. And then one of the outcomes of the, uh, this trilateral summit is this Campus Asia, uh, supposed to be the Asian version of Erasmus program uh, and then uh, collective action for the mobility program, the university students. Uh, and then uh, that was uh, started to be formulated last year, and then this year we are having actually this pilot uh, phase projects. So, so there are many uh, uh, ongoing uh, multi-layered actually uh, structures of, uh, of uh, regional governance framework of higher education uh, in Asia. Uh, so uh, I, uh, collaborating with uh, JICA Research Institute, uh, we uh, conducted a survey uh, for the leading universities in uh, of 300 leading universities in Asia, and then uh, we found that uh, interesting actually uh, findings. I mean, in South Asia, the uh, South Asian leading university regard. South Asia as the most important and active partner, and followed by uh, Northeast Asia, and then at present, uh, Western uh, Europe and uh, North America. But uh, in North America, uh, North uh, East Asian, I mean, uh, Chinese, Korean, Japanese uh, leading universities, North America uh, is the uh, most active and important uh, partner regions. Uh, uh, followed by Southeast Asia and Northeast Asia and Western Europe. So our findings uh, of North America are the most active and the project to be the most active uh, partner for uh, Northeast Asia and leading universities clearly indicates that uh, uh, appropriate partnership with North America needs to be included in the future dialogue for a regional higher education framework in East Asia. Uh, if you look at the relationship between uh, Asia and Europe, uh, there is a, 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 a policy forum called uh, Asia Europe Meeting, uh, ASEM. And then uh, ASEM is not only in higher education, but uh, uh, ASEM is very active actually in higher education to link uh, between this uh, regionalized uh, higher education uh, in Europe and then regionalizing higher education in Asia. So uh, uh, I think. Uh, sorry. So, so uh, uh, we, uh, I'd like to propose actually that, that, that this necessity to establish uh, some kind of policy forum between the North America and Asia uh, in the field of higher education to link, uh, the re-link actually, because it's in the, we already have been very much linked, but uh, uh, as a policy, we should also facilitate the two regions' uh, <coughs> uh, higher education uh, collaborations. Uh, of course, the APEC uh, or uh, new East Asian Summit, actually, because new uh, Asian, East Asian Summit is going to be, I mean, uh, the, the United States is going to be a member of the East Asian Summit somehow, actually, uh, uh, starting this year and uh, next year. Uh, so uh, can be, actually, the, uh, the forum, I mean, in this regard. But uh, uh, I think, I think, uh, because uh, the, to... Uh, uh, to link uh, directly, actually, the higher education between the uh, Asia and, and North America. I think uh, uh, we need to have uh, some uh, kind of uh, policy forum there. And then thirdly, uh, uh, about the uh, bilateral relationship between the uh, United States and Japan, uh, uh, we, uh, 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 about the, the coming mobility between the two countries, that uh, we are experiencing, of course, the, the general uh, uh, very rapid increase of the international mobile students in the world. Uh, we are prospecting that uh, uh, probably after uh, uh, 15 years, uh, the number of the international students in the world actually will be uh, probably doubled. Uh, and, then, and also, uh, the long history of the U.S.-Japan mutual uh, uh, educational exchange uh, was a symbol of the ongoing importance of the political uh, political, economic, and social cultural bonds of the two countries. Uh, but, however, uh, no strong commitment to promote uh, educational exchange uh, was uh, observed actually in the last decade. 
actually just starting this year, I think Japan also, uh, I mean the Minister of Education of Japan started to have uh, uh, some uh, funding mechanism to promote a quality higher education collaboration with the United States, but they're not uh, uh, yet uh, operationalized uh, fully. Uh, if we look at the number of the Japanese students studying in the United States, uh, 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 we, are, we are observing a uh, steady uh, decrease uh, of the, the number uh, for the last 10 years. And then uh, now actually uh, many <coughs> uh, uh, actors in the Japanese society actually have now started to be concerned about this. Uh, if we look at, I'm sorry, the next, next slide, uh, the, uh, com uh, for the, the United States uh, inbound student mobility, that Japan actually is now the sixth uh, largest uh, senders for, uh, of the, the students to the United States, but used to be much higher. And then also, of course, China, India is a very, uh, has a big uh, population, but the, uh, the South Korea and Taiwan are not that uh, populous uh, countries compared to Japan, but they're still sending uh, so many uh, international students to Japan. So we should be really have, have to be concerned about uh, this uh, decreased number of the Japanese students studying in uh, the United States. And then, uh, but uh, uh, encouragingly, uh, uh, if we look at the American students uh, studying in Japan, uh, we are observing, I mean, we are having a uh, very steadily I mean, increase of the American students studying in Japan over the last uh, 15 years. And then, uh, uh, that's actually not only uh, happening in Japan, uh, not only in Japan, but also in other parts of the world also actually. Somehow actually now more and more American students are studying abroad actually over the last uh, 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 decade. And then, uh, but uh, uh, anyway, actually over the last 15 years, the, almost, uh, the number is the tripled. So that is an encouraging sign, of course. And then, but at the same time, if we look at uh, this outbound uh, mobility of the uh, international students. Uh, Japan is still actually the 11th uh, uh, host country uh, for the American students. And then uh, probably we have uh, some space actually to increase more uh, to have uh, uh, more American students in Japan. So uh, the uh, third uh, recommendations I'd like to make is that renewed commitment uh, to the promotions of the US-Japan mutual academic exchange uh, and then, uh, of course, the allocation of the additional funding and resources is important, but at the same time, uh, systematic uh, changes uh, and reforms to better facilitate academic exchange uh, is also uh, other uh, important area. Uh, for example, the, the University of Tokyo is now considering the change of the academic year to fall, uh, and then uh, if it is realized, it's going to be a big uh, it has a, a great impact actually for uh, other uh, education institutions in Japan, I'm, I'm sure. Uh, so, uh, in summary, uh, I, I'd like to propose the three uh, directions of the higher education collaboration between the two countries. Uh, one is the uh, US-Japan higher education collaboration on the global issues, and second, establishing uh, Asian regional framework of higher education linking with North America, and third, uh, renewed commitment to US-Japan uh, mutual economic and educational uh, exchange. And I prepared, uh, uh, and with uh, many uh, comments actually uh, provided by the, uh, the uh, stakeholders in higher education, uh, and distributed uh, this paper, and then distributed to you. So uh, for the uh, further uh, discussions, uh, please uh, refer it. Uh, this is the uh, Waseda University in spring. Uh, this year, uh, we had a very quiet and sorrowful, actually, spring uh, in Japan. Uh, and, uh, but, uh, uh, and we experienced uh, many, many uh, things at the time. But uh, uh, thank you again uh, very much, actually, for your cooperation and for uh, the reconstruction and the Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Professor Kuroda. Uh, thank you. Hello. 
I'm Sayashi Raishi uh, from the University of Tokyo. I'm grateful to be invited here, invited to come here and talk with you all. I first met Professor Kuro at Cornell University, where both of us received our degrees almost 20 years ago. My task today is to give comments on Professor Kuroda's presentation, and that is not easy, because as you know, his presentation is very well prepared and organized. So, I'm going to underline his recommendation just on one simple point. Uh, we are grateful uh, we, the Japanese, if I could speak for them, we are grateful for all the assistance and support given to us by so many people in the world since March 11. It is undeniable, however, that we might have lost some confidence in ourselves since March 11, and maybe for us two decades already. Previously, we might have placed ourselves as a good student of Western modernity and a good teacher for the people in Asia for that matter. It might be a good chance for us to reconsider that position. Well, before that, now I remember the following epic poem from the 19th century Java, which is a part of contemporary Indonesia. It was written by the greatest court poet in history of Java, Rongo Warushito. Yeah. Uh, just a part of it, let me read it, try to read it. Turn, turning away from vain desire for the delight of teaching the young, rendered in so beautiful, embellished world elegantly, that perfectly practiced be the knowledge sublime. Imagine how great a guru to be. All satisfied my students would be thinking it knowledge brilliantly new. Now, so one thing kind of worries me, Rong Warushita wrote, should I ever get a student who is smart, then I would be in fearful dread. We professors have this dread. Um, uh, he wrote that in the 19th century. Maybe behind this, uh, uh, we might have had the following imagined learning hierarchy. Maybe at, on the top, uh, whichever it is, nation A, nation B, nation C, or nation D, or, or even the universities. Mm -mm. On the top of the hierarchy, there could have been such institutions as Harvard, Yale, Princeton, and maybe Cornell University added to it. And we have been the good student, and then uh, in return, we have been a good teacher. We might have thought that way. It is high time for us to change that kind of old hierarchical perspective of the world of learning. In the aftermath of the Great East Japan earthquake, I would like to propose to ourselves, let us get relaxed a little. Uh, here, finally, I'm going back to Professor Kuroda's uh, recommendation. He, po he pointed out to say that uh, increase in Asian student mobility and Asian inter-university partnerships underscores the need to establish policy for a regional framework for international cooperation. Yes, indeed. And he also said that uh, student mobility is also on the rise between North America and Asia. Indeed. That uh, I interpreted in my own way in the following week the institutionalization of university exchange network, which includes both North America and Asia, is needed. The previous student exchange model we had in mind could be somewhat like this, which I should call Mecca pilgrimage model of university student exchange. 
It, it was a journey to the Holy Land. All the students at the end are hoping to run at the center. And they could have come back to their country of origin and try to reproduce what they have done. The production of Harvard, Air, Princeton, and maybe Cornell University in their own countries, and then the secondary reproduction of it down. Now, after getting relaxed a little, um, the second picture, this is a new student exchange model, which I would like to call Ohendo pilgrimage model was a circulatory journey to the holy lands. There are holy lands, many of them. Uh, oh, uh, just in case that our uh, internet address is uh, information about Ohendo, if you want to check it. But it is written in Japanese, I'm not sure. Uh, anyway, it is a traditional Japanese kind of pilgrimage. People visit shrines and temples, many of them. Uh, that is, a, instead of the Mecca pilgrimage model, I'm here proposing Ohendo pilgrimage model. And uh, for example, a few weeks ago, one of the students of the University of Tokyo came to ask me some advice. She was going to the Beijing University in September this month. And after two years, she plans to move on to one of the universities in America. So in fact, young people have already started going through this Ohendo kind of uh, pilgrimage model. Maybe going to from Tokyo University to Beijing University and one of the universities in America, hopefully Cornell University, or then could go on to Singapore University or some, so on and so on. Uh, this Ohendo pilgrimage model of student exchange uh, could have the following characteristics. One, the students can get started wherever they like. Not starting from the bottom to up, but wherever they like. The diversity among the universities is the motivation and the engine of the students' mobility. It is not, it is not the hierarchical order of knowledge, but the diversity that is the engine of the student's mobility. And they may stop wherever they like, as the Japanese Ohendo pilgrimage is like, and they may restart moving whenever they like. They might get married, or they are young people, so they might get married, find jobs, and have children on their way. would point out the problem of language. Yes, indeed, the language is a barrier for free mobility. So let us make the barrier into the opportunity. The local regional language training centers would offer the kind of summer schools where the students from different universities and nations live together for maybe two months and get to know each other. Uh, going back to this, uh, each MA, MB, MC could have their own language centers. For example, maybe MC could be could have Chinese language summer school, and the students not only from MB but MA, ME, MD who are interested in studying MC would come to study Chinese language there and live together for two months. So. The students from NB, MA, ME, MD would get to know together and they would start communicating through the Chinese language. And each local uh, language center could do that. And uh, I know that um, America has had good experiences of this kind of summer language schools. Uh, so uh, this going through. 
at the local language training centers, live together, and get to know each other. So this is that campus Pacific, both Asia and North America. Um, there's some signature from the University of Tokyo. In the campus of the University of Tokyo, we have Sanshiro Pond, a pond in the center. So we are going to have the Pacific Pond in this campus Pacific. Well, so this is the uh, underlying comment I'm going to give, I'll be given to Professor Kuroda. And can I have one more minute? Yeah, sure. Okay. And this is the end of my comment. But just, I have appendix. And uh, because I've been studying the globalization of Japanese popular cultures, such as Japanese comic, manga, or animation, they're called anime, and so on. So let me give you just some photos of it. So we're starting here, manga fair, a comic, comic market at Tokyo Big Side. Uh, and then goes on to the University of Taiwan Manga Fair. And here, the entire uh, gymnasium, it, they're, going, they're having the manga fair there. I have tons of pictures, but just a, just a few of them here. And in Bangkok, manga shops and manga street, uh, these small manga shops are jointly owned by the university students, and they are working here. And Jakarta, publishers and uh, bookshops, manga bookshop, and manga seminar at FPT University in Hanoi this month. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, this year, uh, after the manga seminar, I was asked to give a lecture on manga there. And manga cafe in Paris, and this young man, he said he comes to manga cafe twice a week. And these uh, manga anime fans in Warsaw, uh, <coughs> sorry, Poland, they are studying Japanese language hoping to visit Japan to study manga. These are happening in all over the world. I've been visiting uh, almost 20 countries by now. And so young people are already doing something new in this globalizing world. So it is also high time for us to try to understand what is happening among the young people in this world in the 21st century. Uh, just, but my comment was about that campus Pacific, with a Pacific Pond in the center. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. If you don't mind. <laughs> okay, uh, is this, uh, my, do you hear me? Otherwise I will go there. Okay. Well, uh, also another type of variation, we don't have PowerPoints. <laughs> okay. Well, again, my, my name is Indri Asiel Mumba. It's uh, quite a pleasure for me to be here. And I want to thank uh, Professor Kuroda, I have had many occasions to tell everybody that he was a, a stellar student at Cornell. I don't know if it is, a, some people don't like even that, to say that you're a great student, you want to be rebellious and not to do the right thing, but you were a great student at Cornell and uh, your ascension to where you are today is a good indication of the promise that uh, you showed there. So thank you. Um, I have really a few comments to a very rich paper, because if you want to comment, uh, then it becomes a whole another paper. But uh, there's a, we don't have the same time. It has 20 minutes. We have 10 minutes. So you cannot <laughs> comment on <laughs> So maybe it's another reason. Um, and uh, I want to thank uh, also uh, Mr. 
Yasunaga for the impeccable organization uh, that uh, made it possible to be here, and everybody. Um, well, the aspect I have chosen to comment on is the global dimension that Professor Kuroda articulated in his uh, paper. In essence, uh, the whole paper is on uh, the global dimension of, of the world. Since talking about uh, Asia and North America is global in itself. But I'm, I'm talking about beyond those two sites. Well, um, the, I have titled my short comment, um, Higher Education, Globalization, Brain Circulation, and Knowledge Production. Um, the first point I want to make is that higher education and the site where that higher education is provided um, is in itself a concrete meaning to the notion of global village. Whether we go back to ancient time, in uh, my own continent, uh, al Azhar University, Sankore University at Timbuktu, these were sites of attraction of people from near and far. So that global dimension is part of the essence of higher education, the production of knowledge, and the use of knowledge. Uh, in the contemporary world, with the new information and communication technology, and the extraordinary ability of the young people to take every time one step further what is invented today to communicate, it it's, uh, adds another uh, dimension to that global essence of higher education uh, in the contemporary world. The quest of knowledge, the use of knowledge, the need to connect, the global uh, being, uh, some philosophical dimension, technological practical dimension, they all take their meaning in that site of higher education. The second dimension I want to mention here, and if we have uh, time for uh, comment, I can elaborate on them. Uh, well, you have heard a lot about uh, Cornell University here. <laughs> Because I'm teaching there, I got my degree from elsewhere, but I have been there for 20 years. Um, every year, there's an organization there, a, a service called the International Student Scholars Office that welcomes international students, particularly uh, graduate students, professional students. And uh, for more than 10 years, I have been asked every time to join them in the orientation to focus on academic success at Cornell. Uh, Sometimes 500 students, other time 800. And every single time I ask myself this question when I face them talking, what will happen with them? Where will they be? What will they be doing? In which ways they will be connecting to the world? The way they have planned or the way it happened just uh, by accident? So these are some questions that I ask myself uh, all the time. Um, how the issue of convergence in one place in creating a global world. The third question or the third point I want to focus on to illustrate my um, comment is that uh, uh, last year I contributed uh, to the UNESCO Institute for, um, of Statistics uh, in um, producing its uh, 2010 edition of its publication called Global Education Digest. And in the part that was assigned to me in doing my research, I had to deal with uh, issues connected to global countries of destination of internationally mobile students worldwide, gross outbound and inbound enrollment ratios. So uh, although the focus was elsewhere, I was very much interested in that 
uh, aspect of the global circulation. The notion that you mentioned earlier, um, when students go to uh, outside of their countries to study the expectation that they would go back and, and make contribution there, uh, my own continent has uh, suffered from what has been labeled a brain drain. But the notion, even if it's real, and the impact in many universities, one professor leaves and hundreds of students have no teacher. And it, it, it uh, translates into an added load to another professor. However, the idea that it is one dimension, brain drain, it means that when it's gone, it's gone. It's one direction. Well, that notion has been challenged. And then the notion of brain gain came around. And more and more, there's a talk about brain circulation. I think it connects also to the point you were both making. So the world is no longer that the separate site, but it's constantly in movement. And again, with the technology now, it's possible to be in, in motion, even without moving across the globe. So this is one dimension. And then uh, finally, uh, maybe my 10 minutes are almost over, so I'm, I'm really going to the point. The final point here uh, in addressing an important component of Professor Kuroda's paper is the critical issues of the bilateral framework in the context of globalization. Well, here, forgive me if I focus on some kind of experiential uh, uh, component, but it's uh, from this observation that I have been reflecting on uh, some of these issues of globalization. And here, as Professor Kuroda mentioned, uh, in the case of Africa, um, I want to say briefly my own concrete connection with the Asian continent was in the 1990s. And uh, my very uh, second significant one was in 1998, when Japan was reflecting on, critically, on its policy of education and cooperation toward Africa. And for some reason, I was uh, among two people who were invited to give a critical perspective. Um, the Honorable Harry Sawyer of Ghana, who had been minister of so many things, and uh, myself, a young scholar, but uh, I think we, uh, I managed <laughs> to learn from him. So that was an, an, an opportunity for me to start to think further on these global issues, cooperation. Um, and then what I want to mention also is examples of many ways in which Japan has developed developmental programs, a set up development program with Africa, which is one of the uh, country or continent, uh, geographical region where I do most of my work. Um, for instance, the Japan Education Forum uh, that um, is organized uh, every year uh, brings together um, scholars, policy makers, uh, and uh, very interestingly, um, while it has not happened consistently elsewhere, in the case of Japan, it has happened. What I mean is the African ambassadors, they come regularly to those meetings. And I have heard some of them even saying, I'm not here now. What I'm saying is not as an ambassador. I was a professor before, therefore I'm saying this. Um, so that was an, uh, another area of reflecting the different ways in which we can use space to advance uh, policy, uh, development matters. Um, and among many other activities uh, that I would like to use to illustrate the point I want to make here, the global connecting capacity of higher education is the uh, uh, project the Africa-Asia University Dialogue for Basic Education Development. This is a significant uh, project that has used a model, the model or the idea of self-reliance, an idea that had been 
rooted in some experiences in Africa, such as Tanzania, but has not taken root in many parts of the continent. And um, through this project, many countries in Africa have come together to Asia. And those countries have gone to different Asian countries. Oh, I'll cite just a few countries here. Um, Burkina Faso, Ethiopia, Ghana, uh, Kenya, Malawi, Niger, Madagascar, uh, Nigeria, Tanzania, uh, Uganda, Zambia, uh, many others. And they have visited several institutions, countries, uh, India, um, Malaysia, Vietnam, um, Thailand, <coughs> And also scholars from those, those countries and institutions participate. And the Africans who go to Japan for this project, once they uh, visit those other Asian countries, come back to Japan. Um, and uh, I have participated in different ways. Sometimes I review the project, uh, travel there. Other times it is from Skype, sitting in my office and late at night, because of the time difference, I call my students, and it becomes another exciting moment. Uh, the student from different parts connecting the African who are at the United Nations University. So um, the, the, I don't have time to elaborate on the really profound significance of this, but what I want to say is that uh, what could enrich further the reflection is to put the bilateral model in a global framework. Uh, because of course there is the Tokyo International Conference uh, uh, on Africa, or DEVLOTICAT, that bring high level uh, uh, ministers and so on and so forth to, to meeting, and many, many more. So uh, the, the point is that the bilateral framework is a two-way model, while in the reality, in the real world, the two countries that are being analyzed in the bilateral context are involved in so many other things, some in a convergent way, sometimes in a different ways. So how to complicate further the model of bilateral relation by bringing uh, factoring in all these elements that are happening at the same time. Uh, what happened with all this international constant movement of, of students, um, Africans studying here and then going to Japan as an as a, as a invited uh, guest. And, and then uh, on uh, this uh, project that I mentioned, uh, many of the participants studied in the United States. Some studied in Europe, many studied in Africa. So how do we bring all this together? So my point is, you, a paper is very rich. I don't know when you finish it, it will become like an encyclopedia uh, because there are so many great ideas. So uh, I, I want to uh, complicate it further by bringing in how do you uh, elaborate a bilateral model while framing it more consistently in a, a, a global uh, moving uh, context. So these are just a few words uh, that uh, I hope uh, will contribute to our discussion. I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for the supervision that I received. OK, I guess I will. Um, uh, I don't have a PowerPoint either, so maybe I will continue the trend. Uh, my name is Jim Williams. I am uh, teach at George Washington University. I see a couple of people here from George Washington. That's great. Um, Cornell, not that it's not a great institution, and Tokyo and Waseda, of course, but we also uh, want to think of our own. Very grateful for the opportunity to be here to uh, talk uh, with you a little bit. Uh, I'm hoping to keep to my time, so I'll try to be brief. Um, it's also the end of the, we really want to have a conversation rather than to talk, totally talk at you. And so uh, hoping to get to that quickly, so I need to get through my remarks, don't I? 
Um, I'm particularly, uh, uh, on the occasion, uh, the, the earthquake has been mentioned, and uh, that's uh, just a quick note of uh, condolences, sympathies, uh, best wishes. Uh, our hearts go out to, to everyone uh, who has suffered and continues to suffer. Uh, as we think about these tragedies, it's, uh, I, I've, I've been in, with, involved in J with Japan for a long time, uh, and, uh, since 1972, I suppose, when I was a, an exchange student at Waseda, or a, an international student at Waseda, which is another reason it's great to be here. But um, one of the things that I admire so much about Japan is the, uh, the grace, resilience uh, of the people, and the uh, earthquake response is really uh, an amazing lesson to all of humanity, I think, in the, uh, the grace of the response. So much appreciated for that. Uh, for me, I'm a victim, um, not a victim, I'm a, uh, a victim of international study uh, uh, at Waseda. It um, transformed my experience. Uh, I had grown up in a small town in Florida, and I knew there was a bigger world out there but uh, to me, Japan was a miraculous place. Uh, I was there again in 1972, quite some time ago, uh, for one year, and then I went back in 1976 and stayed until 1985. And then I went back last, about two years ago, on sabbatical leave, uh, 2009 and 10. And so I've seen Japan at three different phases, three or four, arguably, uh, of its uh, development. And it's interesting, uh, Asia changes. Uh, I'm, I'm sure the United States changes as well, but Asia really changes. Um, and it's nice to see places that are dynamic and growing and different than they were. When I was first in Japan, uh, it was probably the height of industrialization, just before the oil shocks of 1973. And uh, Japan was a very energetic, uh, exciting place. And it had uh, developed economically. Uh, on a par with the West, and that was the, one of the first, maybe the first country to do so. It did it without the enlightenment and the whole Western civilization that had been thought necessary to economic development. And uh, I appreciated Japan as a uh, myth-busting example, uh, uh, counter into it, it was wonderful. Uh, it also seemed to me at that time that uh, Japan was a model of uh, within, certainly within itself, of, of much greater equity uh, in its uh, distribution of income and care than I saw back home. But that's perhaps why I like Japan, because I think it's a great place. Um, talking about our topic, um, I do appreciate also the comments that the previous commentators had made. Uh, it, the, the earthquake surely has shaken uh, Japan very much, and uh, not that we want such things to happen, but as uh, representing, I suppose, a powerful country, I think it's good to also um, acquire some humility. Uh, not that we want to do it through, through earthquakes and disasters, but humility in a powerful country is a good thing. Um, internationalization is um, a fascinating topic, and universities are somehow at the core of globalization and the knowledge economy, whatever that is, and the movement of people, and uh, those things. And I'm not sure universities yet really know how to maximize that being at the center of all that. Um, I, I don't have the answer to that. But I do would like to talk for just a few minutes about some of the ways that, uh, fairly concrete ways, uh, that we might collaborate, and then a few thoughts. One of the interesting things of listening to the speakers is the catalog of very interesting ways that exchange uh, and that internationalization, international cooperation takes place in the different, in, at least in, in the bilateral context alone and also in connection with Africa. Uh, I benefited from the uh, a visiting scholar uh, kind of arrangement at uh, two of your national universities, which was wonderful. Uh, and I'm not sure we have a system quite like that in the U.S. Um, I guess my point being, uh, this trilateral, the Japan-Africa um, uh, uh, relationship seems quite interesting. And 
we don't, I don't think we do anything like that here. Uh, it would be interesting, perhaps, to catalog our good ideas. The Fulbright program is something the U.S. does pretty well. Uh, and it might be interesting to catalog our ideas and see if we could learn from each other. But that's not really my point. Um, the, um, okay, student exchange is the, probably the main form of global or international cooperation that universities engage in. Uh, Americans are, do travel a lot, and I'm glad to see we're uh, traveling more. One of the reasons for that, I think, is, of course, a realization that we are part of the world, but also a, uh, an institutionalization of international study at U.S. universities. Uh, it's more and more a part of what people do in international study, and, uh, and that has been made possible through flexible programs. Short-term study abroad is, is a big thing. Uh, multiple destinations, uh, classes run by professors overseas, all kinds of mechanisms that are very interesting and perhaps might fit into uh, Japan's uh, efforts to globalize. I'm sad to see that fewer students from Japan are coming um, to the US and perhaps uh, generally, I know there is a population drop of uh, university age students, but I wonder uh, if, about ways to re-energize the international aspirations of Japanese young people and perhaps short exposures, uh, me uh, methods of institutionalizing international study uh, among the, uh, in, in higher education uh, is not some creative thinking about how to do that um, beyond six months overseas or a year overseas kind of thing. Uh, it is good, of course, that people are traveling to different places. Uh, that's quite good. Um, Amer Americans, by and large, as you know, uh, travel for individual reasons, for uh, language <coughs> study, for cultural study, for uh, to enhance their own global consciousness and that kind of thing. That's great. but. Um, People in other countries may or may not travel for those reasons, perhaps to acquire skills or a degree. Uh, at the national level, there are different reasons for study abroad that may not have a whole lot to do with the individual level kinds of things. And I think it would behoove, uh, I think Americans more and more may be looking beyond just the personal experiential reasons for study abroad. And I think other countries may be looking more to the personal experiential and so uh, one of the ways, one of the benefits of, of study abroad for, for students and for countries is that of building relationships. And uh, that probably is the primary reason that US government funds uh, international study is to build a sort of soft diplomacy kind of people-to-people uh, uh, -people exchanges, build up good relationships with people who might or might not like us, but will like us better if they know us, hopefully. Um, and um, so there are many reasons for international study. Uh, Japan began its, um, I fear this is totally incoherent, but um, we'll keep going anyway. Um, Japan began uh, its, uh, inter its westernization period with, by sending lots of people overseas to uh, study and learn and uh, see what can be learned. And um, I think there are opportunities for, um, for, for doing that uh, again, in a, a global and um, a global context as opposed to just a bilateral context. Um, faculty exchange. I wonder, <laughs> faculty do go overseas, they do travel, um, but I wonder that we really, it's not part of faculty life in the United States. It's not, uh, if you go overseas, it's not doesn't necessarily help you get tenure in the United States. Uh, in Japan, I don't know what it does to your career, whether it helps it or hurts it. My guess is it's interesting, but not necessarily relevant. One of the institutionalizations uh, that would help is to somehow find ways to integrate faculty, ex international faculty exchange as part of the academic uh, career ladder, as part of, as part essential to many of the academic studies that people carry out. Um, Internationalization is not just a subject, and it's not only for language, and it's not only for culture, but more, again, this institutionalization 
at the student level, but also at the faculty level of what of, of universities as international institutions as well as national institutions. Uh, I see I'm running out of time, so I'm going to speed up. Um, thinking about how faculty can go overseas, as uh, uh, Professor Kuroda says, require well, it, doing it requires money. Thinking about it requires some imagination, and it requires institutional arrangements that allow faculty to be away for periods of time and to integrate international work into their, um, into their careers. And those institutional arrangements are very difficult to bring about somehow. Institutional development. Uh, the United States used to have a very, uh, an interesting program, university partnership program funded by State Department, which uh, uh, funded university partnerships, US and uh, usually developing country in strategically important countries, of course. Um, that would uh, help uh, develop curriculum with faculty exchange, that would bring students, uh, it, they helped, the idea was to partner with universities for mutual benefit and help the universities develop. That kind of model can also be done in a three-way uh, sort of relationship and, and there's been some work in Japan on doing that, I believe, with the United States, Japan, and say Africa and trying to um, develop three-way collaborative relationships that benefit the curriculum, that benefit the uh, institutional development um, of, of, country, of different uh, of universities in other countries. And I'm not sure that in, in the time of financial retrenchment, it's difficult to see how that kind of thing is going to continue to be funded, but with some commitment with a strategic vision of how internationalization, international cooperation can uh, help in other ways than just the university itself, help in the larger strategic national goals, uh, perhaps that kind of effort can be extended. So funding, institutional arrangements, imagination, and uh, a strategic vision, I think. And also, as Professor Kuroda mentioned, the uh, commitment on the part of the institutions, on the part of the nation, uh, national leadership, and on the part of, uh, you need uh, academic entrepreneurs within universities, uh, people who are uh, interested in making things happen and willing to take the energy to make them happen. And I imagine that Professor Kuroda plays that role in Wasada. It's great. Um, I don't know if, if US universities could learn something from Japanese administrators, but I bet they could. Um, and wouldn't it be fun to exchange administrators, um, to have a whole bunch of Japanese uh, university administrators come here and, and hang out for a couple of weeks and vice versa? I don't know what, what would happen from that, but I think it would be very interesting. Um, when we think about international study, we often think about students, but there are all kinds of people who can benefit. Uh, study tours, I'm a great believer in study tours, and I, I think administrators would be one example. Uh, uh, children, why not send children overseas for, you know, supervised for a period of time? Why not send uh, lifelong learners uh, overseas for a period of time? Government officials, couldn't we send, can we send you Congress? for a short period of time. Um, maybe something could be learned. I'm, I'm being facetious, of course, kind of. Uh, but I think our imagination, uh, universities can uh, are natural exchangers, and there's no particular reason that we have to limit ourselves to our students. Uh, or perhaps people can become our students temporarily as part of a study tour uh, that would actually be quite interesting. Um, OK, a few other things. Um, such efforts, um, the United States, as uh, Professor Kuroda mentioned, um, is fairly good with um, uh, private public partnerships and perhaps some um, Japanese US uh, public private partnerships could be enabled. Technology, we haven't done much with technology. Obviously, there's a lot we could do, but surely Wasada, time's up, huh? Okay. Uh, Wasada and uh, GW could offer uh, classes to each other or lectures or something. We don't even do that. Lots of opportunities, um, lots of frameworks are in place, and what we really need is 
the strategic vision to connect these various ideas. We need some commitment on the part of our leaders and university and national, uh, some energetic people within the system. Funding, and funding is difficult now, and institutional arrangements, which may be the most difficult of all. Thank you.